Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today I want to talk about the secular militaries we have in the Muslim countries, in the Muslim regimes, and uh, the Dajjal, the, the influence of Dajjal. Uh, before I begin, I want to share with you a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about Dajjal that I think is extremely important. And in that context, I'm going to talk about uh, the influence of the Jal, particularly uh, out of the many different sectors of the Muslim society, the militaries of of the Saudi regime, of the Turkish regime, of the Pakistani regime, of so, so you know Malaysia, Indonesia, the whole every Muslim country. Because what has happened is, if you remember, uh, Sheikh Imran Hussein, may Allah bless him, he explains in a very eloquent way. And whether you agree with him or disagree with him, I agree with him on this point. Okay? And uh, so, and that is that <clears throat> Dajjal left his mark in the island of England. When England was that little island that took over the world, and when it took over the world, it brought with it feminism, it brought with it science, science which sees very well, but is blind when it comes to seeing with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. doesn't see Allah, sees everything else. doesn't see the sacred, but sees, uh, sees the material, <coughs> blind in one eye. <coughs> so the island brought to the world the modern economic system of riba. It brought to the world the feminism. It brought to the world a scientific revolution. It brought to the world the Zionist movement. And number five, now I'm adding to Sheikh Imran Hussein. Okay. Number five, when this island retreated back to itself, you see, in order to control the Muslim populations, you know, whether it was the France or whether it was the British, whoever it was, when they retreated, when they were in power, because they didn't have enough army to control everything, they had uh, recruited Muslims from within the Muslims into their army as the forerunners. If you remember how the Khilafah uh, Uthmaniya, the, the Ottoman Empire, was destroyed, who were on the front lines? It wasn't the British, it was the Arabs of Hijaz fighting the Turks, okay? This is history. You know, no one can run from this. And so, shame on the Arabs who fought in the front lines. But, what happened? When the British retreated, who did, he, who did they leave in power at that time? They left these militaries that still standing today in power. And so, these military people, the generals and the colonels and the lieutenants and all of them, of all the Muslim countries, they are the most secular, the most brainwashed, the most corrupt of the Muslims. And so, <clears throat> you know, those of you that have studied Hizb tahrir one of the ideas that Hizb tahrir has, and, and that is that you need to get the military to do the coup. So you need to convince the military. There is absolutely no doubt that the toughest group of people to convince them that you need to bring Islam into power, the toughest group is the military because they're the most corrupt. I remember I was in Chicago and uh, this General Musharraf, the president of Pakistan, had come over to Chicago and uh, apparently he w one of the brothers who uh, had an in with him, I wanted to sit down with him and have an opportunity uh, to talk about Islam, basically, and to basically give advice that you need to bring Islam in, and the route that you have taken is not the route that Pakistan should be going in. But anyway, the information I got back was uh, that uh, Purvez Musharraf is too drunk to have a meeting with anybody for that matter. 
And at that part time, he had started his, uh, you know, new political party and he'd come to the U.S. to campaign and collect funds for his political party. <clears throat> anyway, so that was that. OK. And uh, so what is it that I'm saying? I'm saying that the, the biggest influence, first of all, the people in the military don't understand Islam as a deen. They don't understand Islam as a as a complete way of political, economic, social system. For them, Islam is you pray to God, you say Allahu Akbar when you're fighting, and Allah, Allah, that's it. You know, that's it. <clears throat> and the most secular in terms of when you look at the Turkish army, the you know, the most... Uh, holding on to that British and the French and the Dutch and the Spanish legacy. The strongest group that is holding on to that legacy even today is the Muslim military militaries. And it is these Muslim militaries that have the stick, you know, to control everything. And so even if they have the the you know the musical chairs of democracy sort of call you know what i mean by musical chairs one person comes then the next person comes and the next person comes so when this musical chair of democracy is playing in the background the power in the muslim countries is always whether it is pakistan or malaysia or indonesia or turkey in the background the power has mostly been the military and the military and the the uh, the awam the public the disparity between them is that the public is more religious and the military is less religious and cares less about religion this was proven also when Ziaul al haq was the uh, the dictator of pakistan and uh, what the generals around him were saying about that they're really not interested in bringing islam and what islam and uh, these generals and these military people, they have more friends uh, in in the um, in the in the world that left them in charge than probably even the Muslim politicians. This is the point that a lot of Muslims yet don't understand. We see the politicians, you know, uh, being brainwashed. But we don't realize how much the Muslim militaries, like in Egypt, are brainwashed. The people that are with the military, and then because you have nationalism, and you have the national flag which you bow down to and worship, then, you know, the military is associated with the flag, and so no one wants to criticize the military because they think it is anti-nationalistic, anti-patriotic, and they are the most corrupt of the Muslims. Yet it is seen as a religious or a nationalistic obligation to respect the army because if you don't respect the army of your country, you're betraying your country. So if you're a Pakistani, you have to respect the Pakistani military no matter how un-Islamic they are. If you are Turkish, you have to respect the Turkish military no matter how un-Islamic they are. And the other thing about the military is because the military is inferior to the people, the masters that left them. And they are the masters that left them and they are these house slaves. So they're always looking up to their masters. And they're always looking at how little military they have compared to the military, the great military of the ones that left them and taught them. And has accepted their kids in their schools, in their countries, and and their bank accounts in their countries, and so on and so forth. So a lot of da'wah, a lot of da'wah, a lot of da'wah, has to be done to the Muslim military men regarding Islam. Because they're the most brainwashed. You know, the, the police is also corrupt. I'm going to talk about the police and the ahadith about the police later. But right now I want to show you a saying of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which I think you will, inshallah ta'ala, appreciate. So, 
I'm just going to read the text here. It is confirmed that the narration on Zawahid al-Musnad, and also I think it's in Musnad Ahmad, but I'm not 100% sure, uh, from Rashid bin Sa'ad, uh, he said when Istikhar was conquered, a caller called to beware that Dajjal had come out. And uh, Sa'ab bin Jafamah met them, and the narrator said that Sa'ab said, Why are you saying that Dajjal has come out? I'm informing you that I heard from the Messenger of Allah saying, Now listen to this. Dajjal will not appear until the people neglect talking about him. And until the Imams will abandon talking about him in the pulpits. Now this hadith has two parts. Number one, the people stop talking about him. And number two, the imams stop talking about him. From the member, meaning in the Jummah khutbas, they start talking about him. About the authenticity of this hadith, I want to mention that Ibn Mu'in uh, and, and the, the scholars of Islam have said this hadith is authentic. Hathmi in his Majma al-Zawahid, Abdullah bin Ahmad, who is the son of Imam Ahmad, narrated it through Baqiya on the authority of Safwan bin Amr and it is correct as Ibn Mu'in said and the remain uh, the remain narrators are reliable and Imam Ahmad may have also quoted this but uh, I'm not sure about that but the Dajjal will not appear the Prophet said until the people are neg- will neglect talking about him and not so whether we neglect talking about him or not we have neglected to talk about him in the sense that we don't even know what Dajjal is. What are the different aspects of Dajjal? And when the people will abandon talking to him from the member of the Prophet ﷺ. Of course, no one's going to talk about Dajjal in Mecca and Medina. But even the members, the rest of the members of the Ummah, when the Ummah of the Prophet stops talking about Dajjal, that's when Dajjal will come. So how often is this issue that the Prophet declared as the most dangerous issue to his ummah and the most dangerous issue after him, how often do Muslims talk about it and discuss it and try to understand it and to grapple with it and to think about it? So it can be argued that yes, we still talk about the Dajjal, but we certainly, I think I can argue very strongly, that we certainly have abandoned talking about the Dajjal from the member on the Jum'ah days. And so that, I think, is a true statement. And so Dajjal will not come until people stop talking about Dajjal. And it is possible that we are talking about Dajjal and we're wait, waiting on you know certain events to happen and, they ha- and we're waiting and waiting five years, six years, ten years go by, fifteen years go by and nothing is happening and then we are like, forget that. We thought it's going to happen, it didn't happen. And things are just getting worse. And it's possible that we would abandon talking about the Dajjal. I'm talking about this because the people that most need to understand that Surah Al-Kahf, which is the surah about the Dajjal, the main theme of Surah Al-Kahf is to not rely on material power. Do not rely on the material world. You may have a garden with trees around it and rivers in it, but it can still be destroyed. You may say you will do something tomorrow, but لا تقولوا إني فائل ذلك غدا إلا أن يشاء الله. Don't say I'll do something tomorrow, except you say Insha Allah, because the world of asbab is not reliable. Only the amr of Allah, the command of Allah, and the will of Allah is reliable. And so. You look at appearances like Musa saw the appearances of things and Khidr saw the reality of things. And sometimes even the more pious person like Musa والسلام, who had a higher stature than Khidr, sometimes the person who is more higher in stature, even spiritually, sometimes only sees the appearance of things and doesn't see the reality of things. So... Even though Zulqarnain followed the asbab, فَأَتْبَعَ sababa, He followed the causes of things. Wherever he went, he, ha- he was following the perp, he was following everything in a, 
purposeful in, a, in, a, in, in the world of cause and effect. He was using every cause and effect to his advantage. But Allah ultimately helped him with something more than cause and effect by which he became so great. The Ashabul Kahf that went to sleep, right, is a lesson that things can happen beyond the world of material ways. And so Muslim militaries need to realize there is a world above the world of cause and effect. And because of the low self-esteem of our Muslim militaries and because of their being, being brainwashed, especially in the higher ranks, the higher the rank, the more brainwashed you can assume that the military members are. And so therefore it is the responsibility of the Muslims, it is the responsibility of the Ummah, especially in the Muslim world, to start unbrainwashing the military people. It is very, very important for Muslim pe Muslims in the Muslim world to take extraordinary steps in teaching the military people the deen. Because they have, in the Muslim world, become one of the biggest obstacles from for the Muslims from bringing Islam, number one. Number two, stopping us from ha implementing Islam on us. And number three, enforcing a godless society upon us and un-Islamic laws upon us. They're the ones that are ultimately, in terms of as a group, they are the ones that have played the most significant role. Because with the nation states, as the British Empire left the armies in charge, and with the nation states in charge, secularism and drinking and dancing and not knowing anything about Islam was the, was the way of the generals. You know, even till now, these generals that are in different Muslim countries, Turkey or even Malaysia and even Pakistan, they still drink alcohol and they still live that secular lifestyle. So I wanted to point this out, inshallah ta'ala. It's very important to especially remind the military members in the Muslim world about Islam and to never forget to keep focusing on Sutul Kahf because we're not only in Akhirul Zaman, we're in Akhirul Akhirul Zaman. We're, we are in the last part of the last part of the Akhirul Zaman. We have maybe less than 150 years left and this whole world will probably be gone close approximately by that time. One of the interesting relationships between the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet is the Prophet used to give us Alamatu Sa'a. When will the hour come? What will be the events that will be happening? But when you read the Quran, it, the Quran says it'll come immediately when it comes. You won't even know it'll come. All of a sudden it'll come. So you have to balance this. You have to keep that. Yes, there are signs, but it can also come any time. And the, any time is more authentic because it's Quran and the signs, they're also authentic, but these need to be balanced. And so the last sign, the last big sign that of the Day of Judgment, which is a big event, the last big event that happened, that was probably a bigger event than even the Day of Judgment in some ways. But the last big event that happened was the coming of the Prophet ﷺ in the Qur'an. And uh, now we are in Akhirul Akhirul Zaman. So may Allah forgive us and help us and uh, may Allah guide us inshallah ta'ala jazakumullah khairan assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas jazakumullah khairan assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah ashhadu an la ilaha illa